On behalf of everyone at the law school, I'm excited to say we're just delighted to have with us today this group of distinguished alumni of the law school and the university who all share the distinction of having reached the highest echelons of legal service in their states as either Attorney General or Solicitor General. We have former Maryland Attorney General Douglas Gansler, current Virginia Solicitor General Toby Heightens, District of Columbia Attorney General Carl Racine, and Tennessee Adjour Attorney General Herbert H. Slatery III. They represent all of these different jurisdictions, but they all have roots here at this institution. And we're so proud to have all of them here today in what I think has to be the largest assembly of people called general in a very wide radius, <laughs> including, including I think probably the JAG school too. So we are, we're very excited to have you. Now immediately following this panel, we'll have a reception right here. So I hope all of you will stay and take the opportunity to meet our panelists and welcome them in person. Um, I've just given you their names, but our own um, attorney general, uh, former attorney general Marilyn Douglas Gansler is going to moderate and he's going to give uh, better introductions of the panelists in just a moment, but because I know he's too modest to do justice to his own biography, I'll say just a few words about General Gansler before I turn it over to him. Douglas Gansler, UVA class of 1989, is the former Attorney General of Maryland and former President of the National Association of Attorneys General. General Gansler's career spans the highest levels of public service and private practice. Before serving as Attorney General of Maryland, he was Montgomery County State's Attorney and an Assistant US State, United States Attorney for the District of Columbia. While serving as State's Attorney, he prosecuted several high-profile cases, including the Beltway Snipers, John Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo. He launched innovative programs, including domestic violence dockets and drug courts, and the first internet crime unit in Maryland. As Attorney General, he focused on consumer and environmental protection, public safety and civil rights. Attorney General Gensler is now partner in the Washington DC office of Buckley Sandler. So welcome to you, welcome to all the panelists, and now I'll turn it over for proper introduction. Thank you, uh, thank you Dean. It's, um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I love this law school and I think we all do. Uh, General Racine got a kick out of Modest and, and my name being coupled together. I think that's, <laughs> saw the smirk over there. Um, for UVA, we, uh, so I graduated in 89. I just uh, came back this past weekend from a golf trip with 12 of my uh, classmates. And um, in thinking about UVA, it's a place where people actually graduate with friends. And you don't really see that at other law schools. So you can talk about the academics all you want. But I think one of the great things about UVA was that it's a fun place to go. There are more UVA grad uh, law, law graduates that serve as Attorney Generals of the United States in any other law school in the country. Um, and we have some distinguished folks here today. I am going to not, not speak long as, as, much, as difficult it is to resist and turn it over to the panelists who are far more interesting to hear from. Um, the first, what, what we thought we would do, we really want this to be interactive, so we're going to have sort of opening remarks, if you will, about public service and kind of whatever you want to hear uh, from the Attorneys General and then uh, I'll ask some questions, then you're certainly free to ask any questions. So with that, I'm going to turn the um, microphone over to uh, the Attorney General of Tennessee. And so in the Attorney General world, there's uh, 50 states. There's the District of Columbia, which General Racine will be the first to tell you should be the 51st state. Um, and then there's five other Attorneys General as well. Um, and of the 51, uh, the 50 plus the uh, District of Columbia, uh, 44 of those are elected. And General Racine will talk about he's the first elected Attorney General um, in Washington, D.C. ever. And, and we'll ask him a little bit about the distinction there. But there's, the, the, there's 40, uh, the other, there, there's six that are not, seven that are not elected. And I've always said that the Attorney General from Tennessee is by far the most qualified amongst the Attorneys General. And that's because you don't get to be Attorney General by knocking on the most doors or raising the most money. You're picked by the Supreme Court of Tennessee. So I can say this, I say this in front of them, the, the Attorney General I served with from Tennessee was a guy named Bob Cooper, um, probably the most one of the most qualified, went to Princeton, Yale Law School, really smart, very well respected, still very well respected. He couldn't get elected to something in his own living room, but he was appointed by the attorney, by the Supreme Court of Tennessee and was one of the most qualified attorneys general. And general Slatery has continued that tradition. Um, he was smart enough to go 
to Tennessee Law School uh, to, if he wanted to become the Tennessee Attorney General. So with that, uh, General Slater, if you would come up and make some open remarks. Thank you, Doug. Uh, it's, uh, it's a privilege to be, to be here, a privilege and, and fun, uh, to be honest. Um, Doug is highly respected in the AG world I, it, um, for a good reason. Uh, 20 something years of public service? Yeah. And that's just um, amazing. But I, um, as you can tell, he's, he's pretty engaging. And um, I'd like to meet the person in the AG world that doesn't know Doug Gansler. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's great to be on this panel um, with uh, Toby, the Solicitor General. Uh, that's a key position. That's probably the key position in, in Tennessee. Uh, we have the first Solicitor Gen General, uh, first woman Solicitor General in the history of the state. Uh, she was uh, my first hire and my best. Um, so that's a really key position. And General Racine and I, we, we came in together. Uh, Carl's a good friend, and we've worked through a lot of hard issues. I, that's one of the great things about uh, the AG world. Um, when we get down to issues uh, that we're trying to solve, we work together on a bipartisan basis. I mean, there was a meeting as recent as yesterday, uh, and he and I were sitting next to each other. Uh, trying to figure out the same same issues. So in any event, glad to be here. Um, I drove in uh, and uh, all these memories come flooding back. I came, I was undergrad here and um, uh, I will tell you a couple of quick uh, um, memories. One is uh, I remember walking into the chemistry building which is the largest auditorium on the grounds in uh, my first year and walking in to hear a professor there that uh, maybe some of you've heard of, uh, Ken Elzinga. And uh, Ken, I didn't realize that first day would be a friend. You know, now I'm 60 something years old and we've been friends a long time. And uh, when I became AG, I called him. And then we got involved in a couple of antitrust cases and I called him, I called him again. So I talked to him frequently. Uh, and that is something really special about UVA to have a teacher or professor who has taught more students at the university than any history than any professor in its history uh, to take a personal interest in. I'm, I'm probably one of thousands he talks to. So that's a really good memory. My daughter went here. Um, I'll, um, my wife accused me of brainwashing her, so <laughs> uh, which may be uh, may be true, but she said, okay. You got to take her up there for a weekend. She's got to stay in a dorm, go to a fraternity party, then she's got to go to a class. I want her to see the real thing, and you got to do all this. So we did that. So she went and you know had a great time in a dorm with a friend, and saw everything. Went to fraternity party, saw the good side, the, the not so good side. I told my wife, I said, we're, we're making progress here. So Monday we show up, and she has a pretty pretty good discussion with, in alumni hall with somebody, and then we go to a class. And we're going to. I said, well, let's just go to. Professor Larry Sabato's class. And so we walk in and uh, she's, uh, uh, we can't get in the door. <laughs> I think oh, this is really weird. I know he's popular, but really? <laughs> and uh, so we walk in and <clears throat> we're crammed in the back and Larry Sabato comes in and, and introduces Governor Jim Gilmore. I said, great. Now, now she thinks that governors come in and teach the classes at UVA. So, uh, needless to say, I, I told my wife that she lost on that one. Uh, I wanted to say uh, uh, I have three cases that are matters that I thought might be of interest to you. And by the way, the term general uh, that was mentioned before, I was. I think the first month of month in office, we went to a, a Fort Campbell in uh, in Tennessee and um, on the Tennessee Kentucky border, and uh, it was a consumer protection event. And so we, I was there with the Kentucky AG, and um, he made this great comment. Of course, you know their general sitting out in the audience and everything. He said, you know, before we get started, uh, General Slatery and I want to make sure that you understand that we understand who the real generals are in the room here. <laughs> So, uh, in any event, um, there are three cases that uh, I think may be of interest to you. You know, one of the things that, uh, that, that we're particularly concerned about is protecting states' rights. I mean, we're the state's attorneys. We want to we be sure that uh, those, the, that authority, those rights are not infringed upon. And so, a lot of times, we, we take on and, um, uh, uh, the federal, federal action in some form or manner with federalism. One of them, uh, in 2014, we we uh, had four amendments that passed um, in Tennessee for constitutional amendments. Uh, you got to go through a pretty long process to um, to get those passed, and um, 
And one of them was was controversial. It, it dealt with abortion and um, and basically said um, that you don't have a right to an abortion under the Tennessee Constitution. Of course, we all know Roe versus Wade controls that uh, that principle now. But uh, I think within a week after that um, that amendment passed, a lawsuit was filed by eight plaintiffs, and they claimed that. Um, but basically, Tennessee didn't count the votes the way that they should have counted them. So in Tennessee, when you count votes on the amendments, you've got to take, you've got to have more yeses than noes. That that's for granted. But then you also have to have more than, or a majority or more of those total votes in the governor's race. So you can only pass an amendment during a during a governor's um, election cycle. And so, uh, you know, they basically said, we, you know, you haven't counted them right. You had not counted them right for 250 years. You haven't counted them right. So um, we took offense to that. Of course, that was filed in federal court. Uh, they claimed due process, you know, equal, equal protection violations. And so, um, and the, and the judge was sympathetic uh, the, uh, to, to their claim, uh, on, I think, on policy grounds. He's no longer sitting, so I think I can say what I, what I think on that. Um, but but he um, he uh, denied our motion to dismiss and you know basically said they had a case and so what we did was we we felt like a Tennessee court uh, should decide how how you count votes under the Tennessee Constitution. I mean how, how how more fundamental can it be? And he would not certify that to the Tennessee Supreme Court. So we filed a a, a declaratory judgment action in state court. And, by, and one mo, uh, won our motion for summary judgment. They didn't appeal, and so we had a we had a final decision in state court saying they that they lost their lawsuit uh, basically. Um, the day after that, after the ruling came down in the state court, he he entered an order that said that uh, that the state court was wrong and that um, that they, the state had to recount the vote. So. Background to all of this was there's a huge amendment on how we appoint and confirm judges in Tennessee, appellate judges. And of course they said, well that this doesn't have anything to do with that. Well yes it does, it has exactly the same thing. And so I mean it, this is a serious question. But so um, he, uh, we appealed his ruling, uh, he agreed to stay the recount and um, uh, long story short, we, we got before the Sixth Circuit, the Sixth Circuit, cir circuit vacated their decision um, <clears throat> and we won there, uh, basically adopted the state court decision and, and then they've applied for cert. So interestingly, I think next week we find out whether uh, it's going to be granted. We haven't been asked for a reply or anything, but that's, that gives you a, some sort of the tension that we have and we're wanting to protect states' rights. Uh, there's a second lawsuit that's pretty interesting. Uh, um, that uh, Mississippi brought against Tennessee. Um, they've sued Tennessee, the city of Memphis, and um, Memphis Light, Gas, and Water, claiming that um, Memphis Light, Gas, and Water is just over the state, uh, over the on the Tennessee side, uh, on the state lines, but they're pumping um, millions and millions and millions of gallons of water from. I think it's like the second largest underground aquifer uh, in the world. Memphis has great drinking water, by the way. Uh, and so, um, you know, they're, they're, they're wanting not some comp compact or anything. They, they want $615 million plus. And so, uh, and <clears throat> they're in the, it's an original jurisdiction in the, in the Supreme Court. And we're going to have a hearing on that. Um, in January, but the issue that the, the special master has uh, narrowed that down to is whether uh, that aquifer, which um, moves across six states, is an interstate or an intrastate water resource. And um, if we lose, that's going to be a huge, uh, huge decision in water rights laws. I, I don't know how they're going to handle that on the in um, in the West, but it, it will be huge. So, in any event, that's. That was uh, that's been going on for a couple of years. I think the third um, the third thing I, I would tell you is that um, you know one of the things, and I referenced this with uh, when I was talking with with Carl is is we we do a lot of um, things together as AGs. Um, Multi-state investigations is a piece of that, and um, 
and we're uh, Tennessee's been uh, instrumental, and we and we've actually been one of the leaders in this in a multi-state investigation of the opioid manufacturers and three distributors, um, and it's been going on for uh, three years or so. Um, it's obviously huge a huge problem, um, and but we've um, we've made some real real headway. There's a multi-district litigation going on in Cleveland, Ohio that uh, that. Uh, uh, consists of about 250 cases uh, brought by counties primarily. So you've got the counties, municipalities, and then you've got the states bringing this, and the, and the Department of Justice has filed a statement of interest. So that's the type of thing, and we're having you know, multiple meetings and discussions trying to figure out how you work this out. Uh, obviously the, the, the background and the pattern for a lot of this is the multi, uh, is the uh, MSA tobacco settlement back in the 90s when uh, the AGs worked together to settle with the tobacco company. So we found out, we, we, we know that uh, if, if I were to write a letter um, to some of these folks that uh, they probably would just set it aside, but when the letter's signed by, you know, 30 or so um, AGs, they tend to pay attention. So those are the three cases. Just uh, I look forward to chatting with you more. Thank you. Thank, thank you, General. Um, our next speaker uh, I've known since we were young. He uh, grew up around the corner on Festinen Street and um, followed his basketball career where he was one of the mo best basketball players in the D.C. area, went to Penn. Um, the, a couple years after they were in the Final Four, then uh, played overseas. Um, is, uh, he ended up uh, going to here, it was my class here, law school class 89. Then he had a distinguished career at the Public Defender's Office. I happened to be at the U.S. Attorney's Office on the other side. Uh, he had a reputation of being one of the most more aggressive, most ethical, um, easy to deal with uh, public defenders at, at, in Washington. He then went to the Venable Law Firm, which was then or previously been called Venable Basher and Howard, which was a Maryland law firm historically, and it, it, he became the managing partner of Venable. I think he was one of, if not the first African American um, managing partners at one of the top law firms in the United States. And it was a seismic change also because they were now saying that they're more of a DC national firm. Uh, Carl was, had, held that job with distinction. General Racine held that job with distinction. Um, he then uh, ran for Attorney General of the District of Columbia and prior to that it had been an appointed position and which uh, I think is not a good idea and there's others that may take the other side of that but there as an independent constitutional officer you can actually tell in his case the mayor in other cases the governor w whether they're doing right or wrong so uh, General Racine kind of came into the, the AG world immediately became a rock star in the AG world is the head of the Democratic Attorney General's Association currently but works across the aisle with uh, the Republican Attorneys General as well. Uh, General Carl Racine. Thank you. Good afternoon and evening everybody and always good to see Annie and it's great to be back uh, at the law school. I've come back numerous times um, certainly in my private sector days at the Venable Law Firm. UVA Law was um, you know the place that we enjoyed coming to recruit uh, students from uh, the most uh, by far. Uh, because, um, you know, to be honest, I think we've talked about this, the UVA law student tends to be, you know, certainly not only uh, bright, uh, generally engaging and whatnot, but extremely well-rounded. Um, they're just good, hard-working, smart people. Um, and I think, really, that that's part of the reason why uh, AGs and other elected offices are a rife uh, with UVA uh, law student grads. Again, that well-roundedness um, really, really uh, is attractive, uh, not only uh, to uh, employers, uh, but oftentimes to uh, constituents. So it's great to be here. Um, the first person I really had a conversation with at UVA Law was my friend Doug, who I had admired uh, during his time uh, at Yale and you know knew him a bit in high school, and I remember we were on the, the Brown Mountain, it was late at night, it might have been drizzly in August, and somebody made a call for, uh, anybody know how to tap a keg? <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, I think I put my hand up, um, and I, I would later see that Doug put his hand up as well, because we were down there trying to work this keg. 
Um, and uh, it was dark. And I remember just being down there trying to get this thing to work. And I said, hey, man, so what are you thinking about doing here? What do you want to do? And, you know, we're just <laughs> trying to get the keg going. He goes, man, I want to be president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, really? He goes, I said, yeah. So what are you going to do? He goes, well, you know, I figure I'll graduate, be a pretty good student, make a lot of contacts. Then I'll be a federal prosecutor. Then I'm thinking about being attorney general of Maryland, have that work for a little bit. And buy my time and then run for president. Um, so he's biding his time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure he'll accomplish that, uh, that objective if that's what he wants to do. And Doug was right uh, when he said that uh, the AGs, uh, let me tell you about the word general. The reason why AGs call each other general is because they don't know each other's names. <laughs> so, you say, hey, general, general, you should see a meeting. Nobody knows each other's name. It's just general. <laughs> And they all act chummy. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, but uh, Doug was right when he said we look to Tennessee uh, oftentimes on uh, really interesting, complex questions, questions that you know, might get a little too political um, because you know that overwhelmingly Tennessee is not going to be overwhelmingly political in a partisan way. Uh, that instead they'll pretty much call it down the middle. Um, and so, uh, of course, we know that General Slattery has tremendous respect, not only because of the process uh, that he went through and, uh, to be selected uh, Attorney General, but also because of the way he runs his office. And I can tell you that on the opioid issue, uh, his office has devoted more attorneys uh, and investigators uh, to that effort um, than any other AG office. Uh, they take this uh, personally and, uh, and uh, they're doing a great job and uh, we certainly hope that we reach a reasonable uh, settlement uh, that will allow for funds in order to, uh, to compensate folks for who've been hurt uh, and most importantly allow for um, you know, treatment of uh, the extraordinary number of Americans. Uh, who are uh, addicted uh, to opioids. So here's what I'll do. I may talk about a case or two um, during the course of my eight minutes or so. Um, and like Doug said, it's always better to have engagement. So, um, you know, try to keep that to eight minutes. But perhaps what I'll talk about is uh, just a little bit of my career track uh, for, for you all so that you know that there are many things uh, that you can do in law and that you can have a you know, full-on, intense, three, four, five, six, ten-year period in one discipline or one area, be it a private firm or public office, and then move on and do just the opposite. Um, I found it to be incredibly renewing uh, and interesting. Um, so at UVA, I got to tell you, uh, my most impactful experience, I think, first year uh, was um, the, what was it, the farmers, uh, it was the Migrant Farm Workers Legal Clinic. Don't know whether it's still up and going here now, uh, but we did really excellent work. And I remember visiting some of the uh, local farms not so far away from the law school uh, and seeing the condition in which a lot of the seasonal uh, migrant workers from other countries uh, and poor folks uh, down here were working. Uh, and it was clear to us that they weren't getting paid uh, consistent with what the law required, that they weren't being lodged in a you know, decent uh, manner uh, that the law required, uh, and that they weren't even getting access to communicate uh, to their families. There literally was supposed to be you know, a phone booth uh, with uh, accessibility uh, during certain uh, hours. Um, and so these, you know, not even first year really law students went out uh, with the supervision of a, a clinical person and, you know, sure enough, we drew up a legal complaint uh, after conducting an investigation. And we didn't even have to file the complaint because once the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the companies and the farms saw the complaint, they realized that they needed to comport themselves to the law. Um, and I got to say, that was a, um, you know, a wake-up call, uh, certainly for me and my, and my fellow clinic folk, as to the power uh, of the law uh, to you know, right a wrong, 
uh, and, uh, and impact uh, other people's lives. And that certainly has stuck uh, with me. So what I would encourage you to do um, while you're down here to the extent you haven't, is really pour yourself uh, into the clinical uh, courses. I can tell you that law firms and certainly uh, public offices really value um, clinical experience and substantive intern and externships uh, almost as much as they value you know, A pluses, A minuses, or flat out straight Bs from UVA. Um, really getting the experience uh, early on to practice law uh, is, uh, is where you want to be. Um, so take that as a tip number one uh, from me. I left out uh, after I graduated and you know, started working at a law firm, started working at the Venable Law Firm, um, and uh, went there really to uh, get you know, good research and writing uh, experience and hopefully get some courtroom experience and also be able to pay off uh, some student loans. Um, you know, everything was going swimmingly, took on a, a, pro, a, a death penalty pro bono case. It was a gentleman who was facing the death penalty down here uh, in, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, a gentleman named Timothy Bunch. And that particular case you know, really had a, a significant impact uh, on, on my career. Um, Tim was eventually executed uh, and uh, you know, it was the first time that I actually ever said no to a client uh, when Tim asked me to witness his execution. Uh, I didn't think that that was part of the deal and you know, just for my own you know, kind of sense of uh, you know, morals, et cetera, I opted uh, against doing that. But I remember having countless conversations uh, with uh, Tim Bunch about whether to leave the friend Venable Law Firm and become a prosecutor or go to the Public Defender Service in D.C., a great office, and um, you know, start defending poor people. And Tim was clear. He said, Carl, you got to go be a prosecutor. That's where you can have the most impact on people's lives by being fair, honest, just, and you know, locking up people like me who've committed crime. Um, I chose instead to become a public defender uh, because I felt that, my goodness, had Tim gotten the kind of representation that people at the Public Defender Service uh, give, uh, he would not have been uh, on death row uh, in Virginia. But I gotta tell you, um, I now know that Tim was right. Um, now as a prosecutor in the District of Columbia, district is a, of course a peculiar jurisdiction. How many of y'all are from the D.C. area? Okay. So D.C. is weird, right? Uh, so we have the federal prosecutor's U.S. Attorney's Office that has uh, the predominant jurisdiction uh, over criminal prosecution in D.C. Uh, the Office of Attorney General in D.C. prosecutes exclusively uh, juveniles. We do prosecute about 20% of the adult offenses, but those are kind of misdemeanor offenses. I was attracted uh, to criminal law because, you know, obviously I did that uh, at the Public Defender Service. But one of the cool things you get to do um, if you're an attorney general, um, and perhaps so if you're elected, not so sure, maybe we'll talk about that if, if, if uh, the difference between elected and appointed, but certainly as an elected um, attorney general, I was able to identify as an initiative really aggressive reform of the juvenile justice system in the District of Columbia. And um, you know, we have pursued that really uh, from day one, recruited really smart people, um, national experts, and went about you know, really, I think, um, creating change in the District of Columbia. The office had previously had a zero tolerance prosecution. Uh, ethos, uh, and so every kid was prosecuted maximally, and then you know let the uh, let the judge decide whether a kid's placed on probation, uh, goes to a group home, or goes to kid jail. What we found after reviewing uh, the you know the outcomes, if you will, was that the rate of recidivism from this zero prosecution approach was incredibly high. Kids who were placed on probation recidivated. Uh, to the level of about 58 percent. So, you know, probation really wasn't creating safe outcomes for D.C. residents as the kids would come back and uh, create more harm and more serious harm. 
And the same was true uh, for kids who were committed to, we'll just call it uh, kid jail, juvenile jail, even higher rates of recidivism. Um, so what we did was we decided as we were the gatekeepers of the juvenile justice system that we would do something different, that we would really be selective uh, as to the kinds of cases that we prosecuted and that with a whole swath of cases we would treat the young people outside of the criminal justice system with extreme intense psychological based um, evidence-based um, you know services and so uh, we've been able over the last three plus years uh, to um, divert from criminal prosecution well over 2,500 young people um, right now our rates of recidivism are less than 20 percent what's more we've saved the District of Columbia a ton of money uh, probation, the average cost for one year of probation is about 35,000 bucks. The average cost for one year of incarceration is about 60,000 uh, bucks. And if you send a kid out of state, it can be as much as $75,000 a year. Uh, what we're doing in the diversion area, the average cost of our services in diversion, $4,500. Um, so, you know, winning, I think, on all counts there. And so that's the kind of thing. Uh, you get to do uh, if you, you know, either work uh, for uh, an office that embraces uh, some innovation, you know, or you know, if you're the boss, and it's it's just a great, great um, experience. So I'll sit down uh, now, but I want to emphasize that attorney generals, um, you know, have been incredibly active. I like to say that we're definitely ascendant uh, uh, over the last uh, 12 years. And certainly, uh, Democratic AGs, um, you know, have been pretty active in the suits against uh, President Trump. Um, not just to sue, just just because, uh, but to really interpose what is a check and balance on uh, the administration in regards to what some, certainly me, uh, would view as constitutional excess and violations of law. Um, the last case I'll mention before I sit down is a case that. Uh, D.C. brought with the Attorney General uh, in Maryland, Doug's successor, Brian Frosch, uh, and that's a suit against the President of the United States uh, based on the Constitution's emoluments clauses. Uh, cases that we've won on standing and had a favorable ruling on the definition of emoluments. Uh, the President is now seeking to have uh, the District Court's uh, decision certified to the Fourth Circuit. Um, we instead are seeking to have discovery. Uh, so stay tuned on that matter. Thank you. Thank you, uh, General Racine. <laughs> our, our last um, speaker is the Solicitor General of Virginia, but more importantly, a professor here for six years? A lot of years. Uh, at, at the law school, uh, Toby Heightens. We met each other, I argued, as mentioned, in front of the Supreme Court. And what happens when you argue in front of the Supreme Court and you're the state, the so Solicitor General of the United States comes in to steal some of your time. And um, Toby uh, took 10 of my minutes and we collectively were, uh, were successful. And, and uh, he, it was a good thing because this guy was a child molester and I'm, they're not really nice people. Um, the Attorney General of Virginia, is uh, Mark Herring, and a wonderful man, um, has done some great work there. Went to UVA undergrad, did not get into UVA law, which he's the first <laughs> to tell you about. Became a Richmond spider, but he seemed to uh, make ends meet, and now is the Attorney General of Virginia. Um, Toby is the Solicitor General. He's going to talk a little bit about that. The, his 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 uh, predecessor was also a UVA law grad in class of '89, Stuart Raphael. Um, and so, with that, we'll turn it over to Toby Heightens. <laughs> So thank you all. Um, this is really weird. <laughs> really, really weird. Uh, so I'm going to talk about three things really briefly. I'm going to answer a question that I have been asked, and perhaps some of you who know me have been asked, which is, what does my job actually involve? Uh, so I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about what I've learned about state government in the last six, seven months that I've been there, and then I'm going to give you some advice. Okay, so question one, what in the living hack uh, does a state SG do? Um, 
So it varies a lot. So one of the things I actually did when I first got the job is I called as many other state SGs as I could. And it actually varies a fair bit from state to state. I mean, it, it's a title, but then you have to define what the title involves. But broadly speaking, it means being the chief appellate lawyer for your respective states. So I can tell you what we do. Uh, my office handles all of Virginia's litigation in front of the US Supreme Court. We handle a very large chunk of Virginia's litigation in front of the Fourth Circuit, not all of it, but a very large chunk of it. And then we handle a somewhat smaller chunk of it before the Supreme Court of Virginia. The carve out there is that we don't do routine criminal cases uh, before the Supreme Court of Virginia. So that sort of uh, gives you the sense. But, but also pretty consistently in other states, that's not all that we do. Um, we're also heavily involved sometimes in district court litigation, sort of high profile, sensitive litigation uh, that involves things of a special concern uh, to either the Attorney General or just high profile in general. I mean, one of the sort of informal tests is how likely is this litigation going to end up in the Washington Post? Um, and as the odds of that go up, the odds that we have some level of involvement in it also go up. Um, sort of one obvious difference between myself and the previous speakers is, is thank God I didn't have to be elected to anything. Um, but nor was I, I guess I wasn't appointed by a court either, right? I guess one of the other ways that's an interesting distinction and one of the things that's so appealing to me uh, about the job is I'm probably sort of on the org chart of the lawyers in our office, the highest person on the org chart who actually goes to court on any sort of regular basis. There are, there are people above me on the org chart uh, and they do incredibly important and significant uh, work that I have a much better sense of now that I've been working for them, uh, but they don't go to court. Um, and I think that's true at the federal government as well. I think the Solicitor General of the United States is the highest ranking lawyer at the Department of Justice who actually goes to court on any sort of regular basis and is thus functioning in that particular capacity uh, as a lawyer. So that's point one. Point two, what have I learned in six months of state government? So I like to think that I'm not a complete idiot and <laughs> Of course I knew, of course I knew intellectually that state government is smaller than the federal government. That's, that's pretty obvious, right? Um, but I guess what I did not really appreciate is the orders of magnitude of smallness. Just how much smaller state governments are than the federal government. Um, and I think that gives people some really amazing opportunities very, very quickly, right? There are just far fewer layers of bureaucracy in state government, and there are far fewer layers between the most junior lawyer there and the most senior lawyer there, right? If you look at the DOJ org chart, what's the number of layers between the sort of entry-level line attorney and the attorney general? That is an enormous number of people. In state government, that is not very many people, um, no matter where you are. Um, so we have within our office, right, um, we, we have brought on two people since I've started, um, one of whom had her first oral argument before the Fourth Circuit uh, yesterday. Was it yesterday? No, it was Monday. No, it was yesterday. It was yesterday. Um, and, and all of whom are sort of instantaneously involved in the kinds of things um, that you will. In terms of small worldedness, I have already discovered that at least two people to whom I taught civil procedure, for example, unbeknownst to me, work for the Virginia Attorney General uh, because I've seen them in the office since I've been there. Um, <laughs> And that sort of, that's going to sort of segue, I will say, into point number three. Um, there are ridiculous opportunities uh, in terms of working for state governments. And I, with the benefit of hindsight, wish I had thought about it sooner than I did um, in my career. And, and there's a lot of reasons we could say that. Um, it, the, there are opportunities to do things. So this person that I taught civil procedure to, who I think was probably class of 2016, I think. Um, I mean, I found out that she was there when I got the office-wide email saying that she just won an oral argument in the Supreme Court of Virginia. And she is a year and a half or two years out of law school. And those are simply opportunities that you do not get in other environments. Um, and so I think I'd really, really, and, and then of course, the elephant in the room that's sort of been, um, there are a lot of very smart, very capable, very public service-minded people who in a different time would have been dying to work at the Department of Justice who don't want to work at the Department of Justice right now. Now that's a conversation I'm happy to have with folks about whether they should or should not still want to work at the Department of Justice, but there are opportunities. It is not you work for DOJ or you sit out the public service portion of your career. Um, there are amazing opportunities all over the country, uh, but this is gonna be the exhortation. 
The exhortation is that might mean doing something that wasn't immediately the part of the plan. Um, let me give you a concrete example. One of the first things I got to do, uh, got to and had to do, uh, was to replace someone who had left our office to go back to private practice after having been there. And so I had an attorney, so actually it's the, it's the person who had her first, her first Fourth Circuit argument literally yesterday. Um, that turned out to be a surprisingly complicated process um, because I had, conservatively speaking, probably two dozen phone conversations and email exchanges with people. And the number of people who told me, this sounds like a really amazing opportunity, but that is an enormous number of people. An enormous number of people had um, explanations that it was not a convenient time, it was not convenient personally, it was not convenient uh, because of their career, it was not convenient salary-wise. The person who got the job is a person who I called her, I believe on, we spoke by phone the first time at about 3.30 p.m. on a Thursday. Um, and I was trying to get a sense of whether, you know, I like this person sufficiently to have them come down for an interview. Um, and I said, I basically decided pretty early in this conversation that I did. Um, and I said, we'd love to get you down for the in interview. And she's like, that's great, I can come whenever. And I said, I mean, I'm not, I, I love the enthusiasm. Uh, I'm not going to hold you to the literal you can come down whenever, given that it is currently 3.30 p.m. on a Thursday. And she said, I can come tomorrow. Um, and she did. And she came down tomorrow. Uh, she came down the next day uh, and was essentially offered the job 36 hours later. So I guess the one sort of exhortation I will say to you is uh, the thing about great opportunities is that great opportunities often don't come along when they're convenient because one of the reasons that you might be getting a great opportunity is that it's not in, it's inconvenient for you or it's inconvenient for others. And so there are those opportunities, and I guess I would strongly urge you, when someone offers you something, and of course the decision about whether something is a great opportunity is an intensely personal decision for you to decide, but when you are offered something that you feel is a great opportunity, find a way to say yes. That's the big one. Okay, look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.